This has been a very difficult video to make. Not emotionally or anything like that. Just as in, I'm not really sure what to say about this situation. But I feel a very strong need to talk about the death of Queen Elizabeth. Because it's such an important event, and I don't want to allow it to go unremarked upon. I feel as though everything that I'm going to say has already been said better and sooner by others. But regardless, I'd like to say something at the very least. I was shocked by her death, which is obviously silly. It should never really be shocking that a 96-year-old dies. And those who have been gloating because of her death, mostly on the left, but some also on the right, are also obviously doing something absurd, since it's very difficult to ever say that dying at 96, surrounded by your family, and as a very loved and respected public figure, is in any way an L. I think there's two reasons, though, why I found her death shocking. One is that it just sort of happened suddenly. Now, of course, we don't know the exact circumstances of her death, and it may very well have been going on for a long period, but at least as far as public knowledge goes, she, it was just announced that she was dying, and then, not that long later, within the same day, she died. In addition to that, though, I think the other reason why I found her death shocking is she's been such a permanent fixture, not just in my life, but the life of my family, and the life of my country, and for that matter, really, the life of the whole Western world and the whole world, that her sudden absence, even expected, still comes as a shock. She hasn't just been the queen for my entire life. She hasn't even just been the queen for much of my parents' life, but she was even the queen from before my parents were even born. There simply is no other public figure with the same enduring presence in recent Canadian or more broadly Western history. And I think the defining characteristic of what we've lost with the death of Queen Elizabeth is she r really represented the last link to an old world, an old society, and an old way of doing things. Now, of course, that's not to say that there aren't still links to old European civilization that still exist. Obviously, there still are. But there isn't anything quite as tangible and literally living as was Queen Elizabeth. One continued link is, of course, the continued existence of the institution of the monarchy, both in the United Kingdom, Canada, and the other dominions and places that where King Charles is now the head of state. And I think that would make this a good time to briefly defend my ardent support and defense of the institution of the monarchy, because I know for some people this can be confusing. Chiefly, I'm a monarchist because I'm a Canadian. It simply is not possible to try to retain any sort of actually Canadian identity and oppose the monarchy. Canada, for better or worse, always will have to compare itself to the United States. And the institution of the monarchy, as well as the stronger ties to British culture, have always been central to distinguishing Canada. Because of the dominance that the United States has always on this continent and since World War II throughout the entire world, Canada simply cannot remain an even remotely independent country without things like the monarchy, and the monarchy is one of those chief things that continues to identify itself as an independent nation. This is what makes Republican sentiment in Canada particularly ironic, since it's often paired with a sort of pseudo-Canadian nationalism, which says that the monarchy is bad because the monarchy is foreign, when the reality is that the monarchy is one of the last few things left that is keeping Canada Canada. Any Canada without the monarchy isn't really a Canada anymore, just something that happens to share the name. But I know many right-wingers will complain that the royal family are supposedly globalists, especially cited for this is King Charles and statements he's made on the UN and environmentalism. Other right-wing critiques are sometimes offered, but that's usually the main one in my experience. The fundamental issue here that right-wingers are having is that they have a purely liberal notion of what government is, and they are evaluating the monarchy on purely liberal lines. It is just utilitarianism, but with the utility being basedness. My loyalty to the monarchy is not based on performance. That is the primary issue here that right-wing critics of the monarchy don't understand. Now, I'm not saying that the monarchy couldn't do something that could make loyalty to them impossible. The only absolute loyalty that a Christian can have is to God, 
but my loyalty is chiefly to the institution itself, not to the individuals. And that is why, though I do believe Queen Elizabeth was a great, though flawed, queen, it's not even really particularly relevant. And, of course, in response to right-wing criticisms of King Charles, many right-wingers have been sharing clips by the king in which he talks eloquently about traditional architecture or the importance of tradition in society in a way far more eloquent and precise than almost any modern conservative, at least politician. To a critique of the false premises of modernity, a critique set out in one of the seminal texts of the traditionalists, René Guénon's uh, The Reign of Quantity. Now, many find this teaching difficult, not least uh, because it asks us to question our very mode of being, and, and perhaps because it asks us to question an ideology in the form of modernism that has become so set in our minds that any other way of being, of being seems in some sense fanciful and unrealistic. However, the, the teachings of the traditionalists should not, in any sense, be taken to mean that they seek, as it were, to repeat the past, or indeed simply to draw a distinction between the present and the past. Theirs is not a nostalgia for the past, but a yearning for the sacred. And if they defend the past, it is because in the pre-modern world, all civilizations were marked by the presence of the sacred. As I understand it, uh, in referring to tradition, they refer to a metaphysical reality and to underlying principles that are timeless, as true now as they have ever been and will be. And by way of contrast, in referring to modernism, they refer to a particular, though false, uh, definition of reality, uh, a particular, though false, manner of seeing and engaging with the world that likewise is distinguished not by time, but by its ideology. Grand me is what used to be one of the architectural wonders of the world, London, a city built like the center of another great trading empire, Venice, on the water. And when Canaletto painted it in the 18th century, no less beautiful. The London that slowly evolved after the Great Fire took about 300 years to build. It took about 15 years to destroy. What was rebuilt after the war has succeeded in wrecking London skyline and obliterating the view of St. Paul's in a jostling scrum of skyscrapers, all competing for attention. Can you imagine the French doing this sort of thing in Paris, on the banks of the Seine, round Notre Dame, or the Venetians building tower blocks next to San Marco? When did we lose our sense of vision? How could those in control become so out of step with so many Londoners who felt powerless to resist the destruction of their city? There is no need for London to ape Manhattan. We already possessed a skyline. They needed to create one. And there is no need for buildings, just because they house computers and word processors, to look like machines themselves. Yeah, these are thorn bushes, thorn trees. But the whole aim of the, of a hedge like this is to form a barrier to prevent sheep or cattle getting through. Unless we realize that we are ourselves very much a part of nature, and not just separate from her, which is what people have been brought up to believe. Imagine it was considered mad and uh, like to suffer the usual ridicule and abuse that you, you somehow attract for, for, for suggesting that the conventional worldview might not necessarily be the only way of looking at things. Before we started, you, know, you could pick up a handful of soil and it was, I don't know, it had this sort of funny dead feeling about it. All I wanted to do is to heal things and restore lost habitat. And uh, again, I've, I've uh, battled and battled to try and encourage people to understand how important the small family farmer is all around the world. The uh, development and, and uh, protection of the small farmer is crucial but everywhere, all around the world, they're being driven off the land as we speak.
I think it's pretty obvious that these clips are great. But I also know that King Charles has said many things in the past that I also disagree with very strongly. I think the takeaway here should be for any honest observer is that King Charles isn't just a lib or a globalist or a conservative for that matter. His beliefs can't be categorized that simply. But all of that is actually somewhat beside the point. Because as I've already said, my support for the monarchy is not conditioned on performance. And therefore, I have to admit that it wouldn't really matter if all there were were clips of King Charles saying things I disagree with, even if there are things I really disagree with, and none of the good clips. The reason is because I support the institution of the monarchy itself as its own institution, not because of the people that happen to fill it. This is because monarchy is a fundamentally pre-liberal, pre-enlightenment concept. Unlike fascism and communism and modern democracy, monarchy is not something that was invented by intellectuals. It's not something that was invented by revolutionaries. It's not something rational that was created because it's the best way to govern society. Monarchy is a necessarily traditional institution. It's necessarily something that reaches back into time, and it's something that is necessarily particular. I support the monarchy for the same reason that I support my country, and for the same reason, for that matter, that I support my family, because it's mine. Are there rational benefits to it? Yes, I do think there are. But the fundamental starting point has to be the particularity of monarchy, not any liberal, utilitarian ideas of the benefits that monarchy gives us. With that said, the monarchy and the royal family are necessarily conservative institutions, and it doesn't really matter if the individuals in them are not the most conservative figures. I think the best single example of this that I can furnish is a tweet from one opponent of the monarchy, Martin Duncan, in which he is complaining about a ceremony attended by the king in which lots of traditional iconography and dress are used. He is actually seething for a very good reason. Right-wingers often like to make fun of stuff like this as though these people are just being irrational, but I think he's actually basically in the right, at least with matters of fact. This image does actually represent something fundamentally opposed to his own worldview, something that can't help but be fundamentally opposed to his own worldview, no matter the views of the individuals in question that actually are making it up. I'm doing this mostly off the cuff, and I didn't really intend for this video to be primarily an apologetic, but I suppose that's the way it goes. Either way, please pray for the soul of Queen Elizabeth, and Catholics, please pray for the conversion of the entire royal family.